plants use a surprising amount of water. As outlined in your notes, a mature corn plant can use as much as four gallons of water in just one week. That's just one corn plant. So why do plants need so much water? Well, first off, as we've discussed previously, to carry out all of the metabolic processes, such as photosynthesis, plants need quite a bit of water because they take place in aquatic environments. So things like respiration, photosynthesis, protein synthesis, so on and so forth, they require water or an aquatic environment in which to occur. Plants also use quite a bit of water to maintain turgor in their cells. So maintain cell turgor. Like we discussed before, we can use the example of a balloon. If you have a little bit of air in a balloon, it's sort of limp and it doesn't stay very upright. And plants, especially woody plants, well, it's kind of a crooked balloon, but the idea is as the cells remain full of water, they remain more rigid and more allow the plant to remain more upright so where it can more efficiently get at light and photosynthesize to make sugars. The majority of the water that a plant uptakes passes right through it and evaporates back to the air. But while it is doing that, the plant uses that water to uptake nutrients and also to transport them throughout the plant. So nutrient uptake and transport is where the majority of water comes into a into play within a plant. Plants get all of their water from the soil and if we consider the soil the plant has roots growing in the soil as above ground stems and let's put a few leaves on these stems okay Water that is in the soil is in the liquid form, and so liquid water we would consider to be, in terms of water potential, high. And above the soil is the atmosphere, and the water potential in the atmosphere is, relatively speaking, much lower than it is in the soil. And so water is going to naturally want to move along its gradient, and it will diffuse along this gradient. Now, if the water moves directly from the soil surface into the atmosphere by evaporating, we just call that plain old evaporation. But if the water moves into the root system of a plant and out to the atmosphere through the leaf of a plant, we refer to this as transpiration. And so water tends to move in that general direction from high to low, whether it goes from the soil surface directly as evaporation or whether it goes through the plant, it moves in that same general direction from the soil to the atmosphere. So let's take a look at what's happening down in the soil with the roots. Here's our root with root hairs extending out into the soil and We'll just say the water potential out here in the soil is much higher than it is in the interior of these cells. And the reason it's lower in the cells is because these cells are full of salts and sugars and all sorts of things that are dissolved in typical cell cytoplasm. And so it makes the relative purity of the water lower in the interior of these cells than out here in the soil. And so for that reason, water will via osmosis want to move and will move let's say osmosis directly into these cells and can move through from cell to cell through the cell membranes via osmosis along the gradient towards the center of the root and in the center of the root somewhere over in here we don't have it in this slide is the xylem And so this water moving via osmosis continues to go cell to cell and right up into the xylem. And once in the xylem, it moves upward towards the leaves. We'll talk about how it moves upward here in a minute. But that's not the only way that water can get into the xylem. It's a pretty good way for water to get in because 
of the nature of the cell membranes being selectively permeable, it allows the water to move in as it wants to, but it prevents other things from moving in. There are nutrients floating around out here in the soil solution, but there also are potentially things that are harmful to plants floating around. And so by forcing the movement or allowing it to move via osmosis from cell to cell through the membrane, it sort of acts as a filtering system for the water that the plant uptakes. Now, there is a second way by which water moves into the roots as well, and it is through capillary action. capillary movement you could say. In this case the water moves into the very tight spaces between these cell walls as you can see I'm kind of tracing here trying to find like doing a little maze puzzle. Okay. In effect it moves towards the interior of the root and the root acts as a sponge because remember the cell walls are very porous. They're full of microscopic little cracks and pores and holes which act basically as tubes and water tends to move into small tubes. And so it will continue to do this throughout the root system unless it is somehow stopped. And in most of the root system there is something that will indeed stop it. And it's called the Casparian strip. Okay, And the Casparian strip is outlined in your notes is made up of a substance called suberin and let's draw it a little bit more prominent here and it's basically caulking between cells and it waterproofs the cracks and crevices between the cells towards the interior of the cell before the xylem uh, is reached by this water and so the capillary water that's moving towards the center of the root at some point it gets stopped okay by the Casparian strip. This for the plant forces more of the water to move in via osmosis which basically means it forces it through its filtering system so to speak unless the Casparian strip is not fully formed and in most of the root system mature root will have a nice well-formed Casparian strip but there are many points in the root system where the Casparian strip is not fully formed and in those locations the water can move by capillary action in between these cells all the way directly into the xylem and let's take a look at a couple of examples of where this might occur at the root tips which we have depicted here on the left and at points at which branch roots arise uh, where we can see water moving into the xylem directly bypassing the Casparian strip and so at the root tips make that a capital R at the root tip water can move in between the cells and right up into the xylem because there is no Casparian strip. If you recall, this is the root meristem, the root cap, and back in this region is called the zone of elongation. And so in this elongation zone, we don't have cells that are fully mature yet. And when they're not fully mature, they don't bother to make the Casparian strip. And so water can move in at the root tips quite easily directly into the xylem. The other place at which it can enter easily is again at these branch points and the reason is they can move between these cells until they reach the Casparian strip which normally is right in this area okay the Casparian strip is going to run right along in that area in, in the interior of the root is where you see the xylem and the phloem okay. and so this acts as a barrier unless there's a side root coming out at which point it emerges from the center of the root and it burrows or breaks its way through the existing cells and as it does that it also punches right through the Casparian strip and creates a hole in the Casparian strip and so when water moves in bypassing this Casparian strip and goes directly into the xylem we call this bulk flow and while the Casparian strip forces the movement through a cell 
in regions where the Casparian strip is not fully developed, like the root tip or a root branch point, label that over here, we can have bulk flow occurring. 